It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show, only on Secular Media Network. Everybody, this is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to the Phil Ferguson Show. This is show number one five nine. A little later in the show, we are going to have an interview with Guy P. Harrison. So, I uh, actually was a listener request. So, thank you very much. You know who you are, and I think you're going to really enjoy the interview. Uh, talking to him about all of the books that he's written, and well, we talk about how the brain works and how religion works, and or maybe doesn't work. We'll see. Anyway, the thing I had for today, oh, by the way, uh, if you're a, a new listener, uh, we're going to cover topic next week. I'm going to finally do it. I've been teasing this forever. It just I think I've kind of got all of the notes organized or I will by next week. Why you should not save for college. So if you have kids, young kids, teenage kids, you're going to want to listen to that show. Um, it might surprise you some of the things that are in it, but Hopefully you'll have fun, and maybe you can even disagree with me and correct me because I am open to that. Uh, I get better through time, I hope, by correcting my mistakes, but I, th I think you can learn some things. Uh, today we're going to talk about life insurance. I actually had a couple of different emails, and I'm going to kind of merge them together to give you a, a general sense, but uh, uh, you know, someone contacted me and said that their friends and family weren't telling them that they had to go get life insurance, and they went and met with an advisor who, you know, used high-pressure sales tactics to tell them that they do need this life insurance, they need more than they thought they needed, and they have to get it right away because if you don't get it by Friday, this offer may not be around again. It's one of those things about the industry that I hate. I also hate it with a passion when I want to look at buying a new or used car. Um, I, I know exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it, and I also know that Often it works, so they're motivated to continue doing it, but it pisses me the fuck off. Um, I've had multiple times I've left dealerships in uh, in a very um, undiplomatic fashion, let's just say. Uh, if you guys want, you know, let me know. Maybe I'll tell you one of those stories on the show, but it is something that uh, can be very upsetting for me, which is one of the reasons why I run my business the way that I do. Matter of fact, I was just talking to somebody uh, that had called me up and we went, we talked about the things that I do and, and they said basically, well, Phil, I, I already do all that stuff by myself. Why, why would I pay you? And I said, you, you don't have to pay me. No, no one has to pay me. Uh, every client is a client at will. And it's just one of those things that some people don't want to do this on their own. The analogy I give regularly is it's like uh, doing car repairs. I could do car repairs, I think, theoretically, if I did a little study and I bought the tools, I don't want to. Some people don't want to take care of their lawn. They hire a service for that. I actually adore mowing my lawn, so I will do that. It's a wonderful thing that we're in a society where you can pick and choose the things that you want to do with your time and do it. If you love investing, if you've done the research and you've studied and you think you've got it under control, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You don't have to hire me. But there are a lot of people that have other things to do. They have a job that keeps them very busy but pays them very well. They have a family. They have kids. They don't want to take the time or a lot of people, and it, it, I don't understand it because I like it so much, but there's a lot of people who just don't want to do it. And that's where you hire out of service, just like I pay somebody to um, fix my cars or you might pay someone to clean your house because you know how to. You just don't want to, and you'd rather pay for it and have someone else do it and not worry about it. So anyway, back to these people that talked to me about insurance. Uh, they described all these high-pressure sales tactics of you, you got to get it right away, and this is going to be the best thing ever, and the company's probably going to pull it off the shelf if you don't get it. And one of them contacted me, and let's just say she was 25, and she says, what do I need insurance for? Life insurance. Why? I don't get it. Why do I even need it? People are telling me I have to have it. And I said, well, if you can't think of a really good reason 
to buy life insurance, then don't buy it. Now, you can do some research. You can read on the, uh, on the Google, on the inner tubes, and, and you could do some research yourself. But why would you go into any store and buy any product if you didn't have a really good reason that you wanted to buy it? A lot of the reasons people get in trouble is because they spend money on things they don't need to spend money on. So that's one of my first questions. And they asked me, I said, well, Phil, when would I need life insurance? Well, different people have different opinions. The most common situation that I tell people to think about is if somebody else is dependent on you working and you bringing in an income, if you suddenly died, how will they pay the bills? That's when you want to look at life insurance. So if you're married and your spouse doesn't or can't work, if you have children uh, that can't work or are too young to work, that can't pay the bills if you're not around, that's why you get life insurance. And it's true that the younger you are, the less the life insurance will cost. I almost always recommend to people, you buy term and you invest the rest. It's been said before, I didn't come up with it, but when you get your car insurance, like you, you get uh, liability and collision insurance on in your car, you don't also invest money so why would you get life insurance and invest money? If you want to invest, do the research and find the best investments for you and shop the life insurance. So you can go look for it. You don't buy life insurance from the first person that happens to get you to sit in their office and pressure you into it. If you don't want it, A, don't buy it. If they're pressuring you, B, leave. If you decide you do want life insurance for whatever reason, now you do shopping just like you would shop for which phone you're going to buy next or which car you might buy or a camera that you might buy. People still buy cameras? I, I'm sure people who are more into photography than me, my uh, cell phone usually is good enough, but sometimes it's not. But anyway, people don't spend time looking at the life insurance. Check it out. Look online. I think select quotes and other places like that. You can go find out what the proper cost for some of the stuff is. The other odd thing that I've had come up a few times lately is uh, apparently one of the things that I've said has struck a chord and people keep quoting it back to me, and that's when I call in saving 10% as the suck-ass minimum. I just was something that flew off my tongue one time, and it kind of gets the point across, but uh, people seem to love it. So uh, anyway, that's my little ranting about insurance and life insurance and how much you should get. Uh, you know, get term, uh, invest the rest shop for it. Don't just buy it from whoever happens to corner you or get you to come into an office. Uh, anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, if you need help with anything or have questions about investments, you can email me, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. And if you do do that, please include your phone number and I will give you a call and we'll set up a time to talk. This stuff is usually complicated enough and I'm not good enough. I'm not well enough. I'm not sufficiently skilled in the writing stuff. So it it's best for me to talk to you in person so we can communicate and, and get through it. But let me know, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. And what we'll do is we'll uh, take a quick commercial break and then we'll go into the interview and I'll see you on the other side. Here's an excerpt from The God Virus by Daryl W. Ray. Every day, religion affects us in ways we may not realize. It makes your Uncle Ned spend hours praying for you. It gives your Baptist neighbor a reason to reject her own child who married a Catholic. It teaches your Pentecostal sister to spank her children to keep them from going to hell. It requires a Catholic priest to deny his sex drive. It causes people to give enormous amounts of money to religious organizations and causes you to avoid talking to your cousin Jenny for fear she may try to convert you to Jehovah's Witnesses. Religion is both obvious and subtle influences on you and on society. This book explores the impact of religion on you and your world. It draws open the curtain of mystery and offers ways to understand and make informed decisions about religion. Have you ever wondered what makes religion so powerful? What makes people profess deep faith even as they act in ways that betray that faith? What makes people blind to the irrationalities of their own religion yet see clearly the problems of other religions. 
How does it weave its way into our political system? If these and similar questions interest you, this book will help you understand its power in you, your family, and your culture. The God Virus by Daryl W. Ray is available at atheistaudiobooks.com. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Phil Ferguson, and of course, you are listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. Joining me now, as promised, is Guy P. Harrison. Guy, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Phil. And, and we were talking pre-show about this P in the middle. What, what's with that? Can't you just be Guy Harrison? Oh, believe it or not, the world is full of authors named Guy Harrison, so I have to throw in my middle initial there in order to kind of separate myself from the pack so it doesn't confuse people, you know? I don't, so, I don't want to, you know, coast on the, uh, the hard work of others, so I don't want to, you know, ride the coattails of all the other Guy Harrisons out there. I'm trying to make <laughs> it on my own, so I kind of set myself apart by using that middle initial. There you go. So listeners, when you go to Amazon, and you can pause at any time and go buy books, right, Guy? Is that Okay. Oh, that's, yeah, music yeah. to my ears. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go to Amazon, make sure you search for Guy P. Harrison, and you'll go right to it. Um, and, you know, we were just uh, talking a little bit uh, before the show starts. Yeah, you've got a handful of books now, right? W what's going on here? Oh, yeah, I've got, well, six published so far, six nonfiction books. I just finished a science fiction novel. The manuscript is done, so now I'm tinkering with it and polishing it up, getting ready for that. So I'm trying to branch into the whole fiction side of things as well. I'm working on another nonfiction book about, I don't want to talk too much about it right now, but it's about prehistoric people. Ooh. And then there's yet another one that I'm kind of got about a third of that done. I'm tinkering with it. It's about the uh, the glory and wonder of science, how we are so lucky to live for all our problems. We're so lucky to live in these times when we know so much, and yet there's so much more to know. It's just exciting times. And, and I think science is the ultimate show. It's everything. It's the cosmos. You know, it's everything. It's nature. It's our own inner thoughts. It's just the the grandest, greatest spectacle ever. And so I'm writing this book that just tries to turn people onto that and get them excited about reality, the universe, themselves, their history, their past, the future, you know, possibilities, to just really get people excited about it so that they will appreciate science more and get more out of their lives. So, so I'm thinking, and I, I don't want to speak for you too much, but I'm thinking that uh, you probably believe that we get more out of science than religion. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's fair yeah, to say. Where, where do I begin? I mean, yeah. Uh, if you're sick or injured, I would turn to science. If you are trying to figure out what works and what doesn't, I would turn to science. I would not pray. If you're trying to figure out what is real and what is delusion, I would not close my eyes and listen for voices. I would apply the scientific method. If I want to figure out where I came from, who my ancestors are, what's been going on on this planet and this universe millions and billions of years before me, I would turn to science and not some you know, ancient book written by who knows who, who didn't know too much. If I wanted to know what may happen tomorrow, a thousand years from now, a million years from now, I'm not going to trust some TV preacher or some prophet who hears voices in his head. No, I'm going to turn to science and see what science predicts. I, I did I mean, hear I, that uh, religion is good for weight loss, though. If you pray, exercise a lot, and eat less, you'll lose weight. Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Depends on the exercise and depends on, you know, how, how, what kind of calorie reduction you do. But yeah, that can work. Yeah, prayer can work under those circumstances. There you sure. go. It, it just needs a little help. Uh, it's, it's all about the works. Now, your most recent book is called Good Thinking, and it only came out a few months ago. Uh, what's going on there? What, what, what are you covering? Yeah, I love that. I, 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 well, I love all my books, but I really love this book, Good Thinking. I loved researching it, writing it, and I loved just holding this book in my hand. And not in some, you know, pompous author, egotistical way. I just love what's in the book. You know, forget me. I'm not Ernest Hemingway. It's the information in the book. It's the science. It's the, uh, the quotes from some of the world's leading scientists that I've got in that book. It's just, honestly, I... If I was a billionaire, I would buy millions of these copies of Good Thinking, and I would just, you know, 
shove it on every doorstep in the world because it, it talks about our brain, who we are, how we 